In League of Legends, second to ultimates, passive abilities are the defining trait of a champion's gameplay and their identity. They can tell you a lot about each individual character, from the very elementary ones like Pyromania, Voidstone, and Double Strike back in the old days, to the full-on college theses you see on Daredevil Impulse, Sovereign's Dominion, and Dirty Fighting. Every passive ability speaks to one's core experience. An interesting thing to note about passives is that there are hardly any that are synonymous with each other. You might have two that share a similar aspect like Kale and Jax who both gain continually ramping attack speed when hitting something, but the passives are fundamentally different from each other to the point where I'm probably the only one you know who made that connection. However, there exists a surprisingly large number of champions whose passives not only resemble each other, but go so far as to form an entire gimmick in the game. A gimmick that forces the enemy team to be aware that taking them down may not be as easy as they think. Today, I want to dive into the strange yet prevalent archetype of champions with death passives, or passives that activate upon losing all of your health. Definitely a curious bunch when you think of every other passive taking effect only while you're still alive and kicking. Now, even though these champions have death passives doesn't mean you should bank on them to win games. What you can bank on is face check. Yep, we're back with another video sponsored by one of the best overwolf apps out there. Facecheck is an overlay program that provides you with a wide array of information to help you gain an advantage as you play. Normally, if you want to look up players and champions, you would have to open a browser tab, but with Facecheck, all that stuff is presented to you during champ select, in-game, and post-game. For example, in champ select, you can get a list of stats like pick bands, team stats, and even lets you set runes and item builds for the champion you're going to pick. In-game, you get a detailed rundown of every player on the team, what rank they are, what kind of builds they used in previous games, and what their main roles are, so you can check who's autofilled. I mentioned this last time, but one thing I like about this app that I don't see anywhere else is the damage spread. You can see how much physical, magic, and true damage the enemy team does in concept, so you can itemize accordingly. After a game is over, you get a post-game analysis that details your personal performance in comparison to your lane opponent and more, so you can see what you're lacking at what time. Very awesome companion app that's easy to use, all you gotta do is have Overwolf, which I'm sure most of you have by now, then head on over to the link on screen or check it out in the description and you'll be set. Thank you to Facecheck for sponsoring the video, hope it helps you guys out, but for now, let's go back to talking about death passives. So I came up with this topic about a month ago, but when I heard of the new dragon being introduced in preseason 12, I decided to hold off on it, since they bring a very unique mechanic to the table that ties in very nicely with this topic. First things first, because the term death passive is not officially coined or even used in League of Legends, I'm going to explain what it means and what champions belong to it. A death passive is an ability that triggers on a champion when their health reaches zero, distinctively in a way that either extends the duration of their pressure on the field or allows them to cheat death almost entirely. Bear in mind, it doesn't explicitly have to be a passive, but it has to activate on oneself. For example, Akshan has a passive component on Going Rogue, which automatically revives champions who were struck down by a marked champion that he scores a takedown on. This, while having to do with death and reviving, does not count because he can't use this on himself. By extension, Zillion's Chrono Shift and Yorick's Omen of Death from pre-rework do count because they can be used on themselves and specifically activate on death, whereas Akshan's is after they have already died, if that makes sense. The semantics might be a bit ambiguous, but I'm guessing many of you sort of get the gist of this. If we include previous iterations of death passives, there have been a total of 9 within the game's history. Anivia, Aatrox, Scion, Karthus, Kogma, Yorick, Zax, Zillion, and Zyra. A lot of Zs for some reason. 7 of them are passives, 2 of them are ultimates. There's also of course Guardian Angel, a purchasable item that grants you a second lease on life once every 5 minutes. Which certainly does come in handy depending on the champion. So let's go through each of them at a time. Anivia's rebirth is debatably the simplest one of her kind. Upon taking fatal damage, she transforms into an egg, affectionately referred to as Egg Nivia. In this mode, she is unable to do anything for 6 seconds, upon which she revives with all her current health. In the early game, the egg is super squishy because it has reduced armor and magic resist, but it becomes surprisingly harder to crack in the late game unless she's all alone. Initially, it might seem kind of pointless to not be able to do anything for 6 seconds because you'll just die all over again. However, depending on where you die, respawning isn't as uncommon as you might think. For instance, Rebirth makes her very difficult to tower dive since you effectively have to kill her twice, though I'd argue it's still one of the weaker death passives. Scion's glory and death transforms him into a zombie that grants him a bunch of stats, but rapidly decaying health and locking him out of abilities and summoner spells. That doesn't mean he's no longer a threat though. If you spend any time watching Mr. Babus, you'll know this guy hits like a truck in zombie mode, probably even more so than when he's alive. In fact, that's what the Intinct Scion split push abuses the most, capitalizing on the huge auto-attack DPS he can dish out on towers and champions. 
Karthus' Death Defied roots him in place, activates Defile, becomes untargetable, and allows him to use any and all of his abilities cost-free for 7 seconds, meaning he's still allowed to fight for a brief time even after death. It's definitely one of the more powerful death passives considering this is the only one still around that lets him attack you like normal. And it's one of the reasons Karthus players occasionally die on purpose in the middle of a team fight, so they can dish out huge damage with impunity. Kogma's Zucathian Surprise turns him into a living bomb, exploding after 4 seconds, and dealing true damage to all nearby enemies. Very simple. Also very useless for reasons I'll explain later. Zack's Cell Division is a lot like Anivia's Rebirth, where upon death, he splits into 4 blobs each with 1 eighth of his max health that can be destroyed by attacking. Over time, those blobs crawl back to the center. If at least one of them makes it, he respawns with the sum total of each surviving blob's health. Unlike Ignivia though, Zack's blobs are valid targets for teleport, so if a teammate feels generous enough, they can teleport to one of his blobs and guarantee that he will respawn, albeit with very low HP, but it can mean the difference between life and death. Those are the 5 conventional death passives still in League of Legends, but there were other champions that used to have death passives much like Kog'Maz, Aatrox, and Zyra. For Zyra, Rise of the Thorns transformed her into a Ballista which remained active for up to 8 seconds. At any point after 2 seconds of dying, the player could launch a Piercing Thorn in a target direction, dealing true damage to all enemies hit, kinda like a Varus Q. Old Aatrox straight up had a built-in Guardian Angel passive, and to some extent current Aatrox is old ultimate for like all but 5 minutes. The other two champions with death-related abilities are not passives, but actives. Zillion's Chrono Shift can grant himself or one of his teammates a Guardian Angel effect if they die within 5 seconds of the buff being active. Yorick's Omen of Death summoned a clone of himself or one of his teammates that lasted for up to 10 seconds. If the original champion died, the clone would destroy itself to revive the original for 10 seconds and restore them to full HP. So essentially, it was Zillion's Chrono Shift, but instead of a permanent revive, it was 10 seconds. Although, in some cases, it could have been better or worse. Death passives aren't explored very much nowadays for obvious reasons. They're not exactly the most interactive way to design a champion passive because they're only useful when you're dead. And in League of Legends, the idea is to die as infrequently as possible, as every death you contribute means more gold and experience to the enemy team. That's what we all thought until Pre-Season 12 came along. The Chemtech Dragon Soul is the first time we've seen a death passive since like Season 4 during Science Rework. I'm sure most of you know what it does by now, but for those who don't play League anymore but still watch my content, thank you by the way, Chemtech Dragon Soul can accurately be described as a combination of Karthus and Scion's death passives, reviving you for a portion of your health and allowing you to behave perfectly as normal. You could attack, use abilities, summoner spells, what have you, but your health would rapidly decrease, so you had only a few seconds at most before you would die again. I don't think anyone saw this feature coming at all. Anyways, champions with revive passives are viewed rather divisively. There's like a third of players who think death passives are useless, another third that think they're pretty reasonable given the conditions, and another third are people who hate Karthus. Like, really hate Karthus. I don't think I need to elaborate on which death passive is the best. Even though he eventually passes on, Karthus is the only champion who maintains complete and total player agency during his effect, dishing out huge amounts of damage if he makes the most out of those 7 seconds. Anivia and Zack come next in line. While they themselves can't do anything until they respawn, there are quite a lot of implications to being able to revive yourself, namely in that you basically have to fight a 6v5. The only death passive that genuinely sucks would have to be Kog'Maz, as it's also the only one that has fixed value. It can only do that bit of true damage and nothing else. The other five have infinite value. When you think of abilities, the impact or pressure of 99% of them can be measured. Zarat's Arcano Pulse has fixed value, it does X amount of damage. Janna's Eye of the Storm has fixed value, it shields you for X amount of health and gives you X amount of bonus attack damage. One might argue that who you shield can suggest this ability has potentially infinite value, and you may be right on that. But the amount of benefit the ability in and of itself grants you is quantifiable. An infinite value ability is something whose value is not constant. It can either do nothing or it can potentially do everything. As an example, Zanya's Hourglass is considered an infinite value item because of the active. While the stasis lasts only 2.5 seconds, during that time you can theoretically dodge countless numbers of things. You can dodge all 20 something abilities from the enemy team during that time, you don't know. Conversely, nothing will happen and all you did was waste the item, or you can put yourself in an even worse position than you were in before. Death passives are very risky abilities to design for this very reason. Many of them are inherently infinite value abilities because you cannot determine how much value you get out of it. Karthus may only have 7 seconds, but in those 7 seconds he can do thousands of damage to the entire enemy team depending on the situation. Whenever I see someone complaining about Anivia or Zack's passives being useless, to me, it shows a clear lack of understanding just how broken they would be if they were guaranteed to respawn. 
Anivia and Zack have incredibly heavy restrictions on their passives, namely being completely vulnerable because they literally respawn, which means they can keep fighting and therefore on paper, they can contribute infinitely more pressure than the likes of Kogma, who can only do up to 2750 true damage at most. I mean that's a lot of true damage, but it's a fixed amount at the end of the day. With that said, like every infinite value property such as stealth or on target ability, champions with death passes have to tread on thin ice. In any given setting, the amount of advantage you can gain from having two lives may be seen as unfair, no matter how fleeting the second one is. At the time of making this video, take a look at this graph here. As you can see, Chemtech Dragon Soul has a significant 91% win rate upon being obtained, far outpacing any other Dragon Soul, even Hextech. With Chemtech Dragon Soul, the enemy team has to essentially fight a 7.5 versus 5 since each champion with Chemtech Soul is 1.5 times the number of bodies. One such reason you have to skirt the line very carefully with death passes is due to its ease of activation. You just have to die. Ordinarily, once a champion dies, that's it. You're out of the fight for the duration of your death timer. Barring redemption, your pressure drops from 100% to zero. No ifs, ands, or buts. This is why getting caught out in the late game can be catastrophic for your team's chances of winning, because the longer a game goes on, the more it becomes a battle of numbers. Moreover, the later a game goes, the more impact a single champion contributes, expressed even more emphatically by champions with death passives. So all of the things I said so far may seem like they only apply to Karthus, since in theory, it's a lot easier to break Nivea's egg, wipe out Zack's blobs, or destroy Scion's zombie in the late game. And that's not entirely wrong. Just as how infinite value abilities can do everything, it can also do nothing too, which presents a bit of a user experience dilemma. In fact, a big reason why Anivia, Kogma, Scion, and Zack don't have the most loyal fanbase is their passives feeling more pathetic than it is an epic game-changing play. With Karthus, he has total control over how the fight plays out going forward because he can use his abilities, he can target certain champions, he can even use his ultimate in his passive. Anivia and Zack have zero control over what happens while they wait to resurrect, leaving no possible opportunity for skill expression. It just comes down to circumstance and luck whether you revive or not. As Scion, you can control him while in zombie mode, but all you can do is walk to the nearest person and punch them in the face. Death Surge doesn't give him nearly enough of a speed boost to stick to his targets. I mean, technically speaking, Phase Rush and Prowler's Claw take care of that for you, but items and runes should never compensate for something. It should only serve to augment or enhance what is already there. So what can we do for death passives to give the player more agency in their dynamic without creating a bunch of cardless passives where the consequences of dying become a benefit instead of a detriment? Honestly, you can't. Or at least not without defeating the purpose of those restrictions. Realistically speaking, what can you do as Anivia while she's an egg? Like physically, she's an egg. I mean, I played enough Paper Mario Thousand Year Door to know that eggs can jump and bounce around, but I don't think the laws of the Mario franchise apply to League of Legends all too well. Could we make it so Anivia's Glacial Storm spawns on her egg the moment she dies? After all, Karthus activates Defile when he dies. That can certainly add an extra line of defense, but the problem remains the same. You as the player cannot do anything. Making the egg untargetable will just bring the same problems as Aatrox. Giving a free revive is too broken to give to a champion. The only reason Aatrox was balanced in the first place was because his kit was so bad the revive didn't matter. You can't say the same for Anivia and Zack who have pretty dang good kits. As for Kogma, this is kind of an unpopular opinion, but I actually like his passive. The only thing I think they should do is actually make it scary. Someone in my community bulletin suggested we add some weird scaling to Kogma where he does like the base damage plus a portion of his bonus health, but I have a better idea. Keep in mind, this is just theory crafting, but we can make it so Kogma can attach to an enemy champion. While a Cathian surprise is in play, he can latch on to someone like a Zillion Time Bomb, ensuring he will hurt at least one champion unless they go untargetable or have some kind of invincibility effect like Fiora. The two issues surrounding his passive is that it doesn't do enough damage, and it also is very easy to avoid since he doesn't really move that fast. In a way, it's a lot like Zyra's old passive where the player could choose where to aim and when to shoot, forcing the enemy team to be wary of the ballista that is her passive. Alternatively, players could choose to just not attack at all and use the entire 8 seconds to zone off the enemy team. For Kogma, if you want to assassinate him, you have to be prepared to face tank an entire chunk of true damage in return. As for Scion, I'm not sure. Truthfully, I think he's fine as is. Maybe make it so he gains bonus movement speed on hit because it's easy to simply walk away from him after he burns Death Surge. Other than that, I think his passive is fine. Anyway, I can't personally come up with a way to make Anivia and Zack's passive more interactive without breaking them. But I think the Kog'Maw idea might help make its passive more of a threat though, so let me know what you guys think. Death passives are definitely a cool concept because it challenges the very notion of dying being a bad thing and staying alive being a good thing. 
And with the Chemtech Dragon now in play, I wonder if Riot will revisit this gameplay element sometime in the future. For the time being, if you enjoyed the video, I'd appreciate it if you left a like to show your support, consider subbing to the channel for more content like this, also check out my second channel where I do discussion on games other than League. Apart from that, feel free to follow me on Twitter, join my Discord server, and check out my other discussion videos if you haven't yet. But until next time, thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you again soon. Take care.